in chapter nine, the major concept is electron configuration. So very quickly, let's see if we can learn electron configuration in like 20 seconds. If you look at the periodic table with the S block being the 1A and 2A, the D block being in the middle, the P block on the right as the nonmetals and metalloids, and then the F block on the bottom, you can simply determine the electron configuration of any element from reading the periodic table like a book. So if we want to find the electron configuration for sulfur, for example, we would read it starting from hydrogen in the way like this, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p1234. So that would be the electron configuration for sulfur. We are simply reading it from top left all the way down to bottom right to, until we get to the element that we're looking for. For example, cadmium, CD, would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, we're going right through that, 4s2, then comes 3d10, 4p6, 5s2, 4d, and then CD is in that 4d10 position. That's exactly how you do it. So this is true for most of the elements. There are some exceptions, but those exceptions are in the four or the D4 position. So that's right here. And then the D9 position. We'll talk about those in a minute. But that's basically how you figure out the electron configuration. Other things to note, period one, that starts D, or sorry, that starts S. Uh, 1S, then it goes 2P, 3D, 4F. So this relates to the quantum numbers, right? L is the quantum number that determines the subshell, L subshell. So if you are in the S subshell, your L equals zero. If you are in the P subshell, your L equals one. If you're in the D subshell, your L equals two. And if you're in the F subshell, your L equals three. So from the electron configuration, we have orbital diagrams. So these orbital diagrams can be used to write two electrons per orbital with one half arrow going up, one half arrow going down, just like this. And we can fill up our different orbitals with these arrows going up and down. It simply shows the electrons in each orbital. We also have effective nuclear charge. Basically, it means if we personify these electrons and say, if you were in the electron's position, what is the charge you would see looking into the nucleus? For example, if we are this electron that has the arrow on it uh, on the left-hand side, we are looking into the nucleus. The electrons that are below us will be moving extremely fast, so they will be kind of like a cloud around the nucleus. So the charge that we are seeing as this electron will be plus three as the protons in the middle, minus two electrons, plus three minus two is plus one. So that's what effective nuclear charge means. The electrons can be shielded by other electrons to minimize that effective nuclear charge, or they can be penetrating and in the middle. In that case, if you were this electron on the right-hand side with the arrow, you would directly see all positive three charge of the nucleus. The effective nuclear charge can then therefore be quantified by Z effective equals Z, which is the atomic number of the nucleus of the, of the uh, element in question, minus S. S is the electrons in the lower energy level, if we're talking about a specific electron. So this is the general energy ordering for orbitals, which follows the periodic table. So if we were to fill up the orbitals, we have the off bow principle um, and Hund's rule. Basically, well, Hund's rule is the... Uh, we have the off bow principle, which tells us that we have to fill up the orbitals in a way of what I call the open bus seat rule. So if we look at boron, right? So we're looking at boron, we have 1s2 is filled up first, then 2s2 is filled up, then we have 2p1. If we add another electron to 2p, we have to add it in the next position, the next orbital over. Then if we add another one to make nitrogen, we add another one to that other the empty orbital. This is because electrons are all negative, right? They like to repel each other. So two electrons next to each other is not as energetically stable as if it was if the electron was in the orbital next door. So this is what we mean when we say the open bus seat rule, because if this was a bus and you had three bus seats, one electron, you would sit, you would not sit next to that electron already. You would find the next empty bus seat available. So that's why we call it the, the open bus seat rule. And if there aren't any open bus seats, so after nitrogen, we get oxygen, we have to add that first, that other electron to the first orbital again. 
Here are the electron configurations for every element on the periodic table. This is a really important slide. What I would recommend to do is pause the video, pick a few, don't look, and go. I would say even go back to this periodic table, and then you can compare to see an element of your choice and try to figure out the electron configuration and then um, check your work. So when you get to the F block, it, it's weird. So we have an expected electron configuration for the F block, but it does get a bit weird. So the exceptions, there are exceptions. We'll talk about them right now. Um, chromium, in the chromium column, which is the D4 column, you notice how it goes from scandium, titanium, and vanadium. It would be 4s2, 3d1, 3d2, 3d3. But then when you get to chromium, it goes 3d5. There is no 3d4. The reason why is because the D shell has five orbitals. So it's five orbitals. If we had 3d4, four out of those five would be filled up. That is not as energetically stable as having all five of them filled up by one electron. So what we're getting at is that the orbitals like to be either half filled or fully filled. This rule also applies to the p orbital, which we know has three orbitals, and they can either they can each be filled up by two electrons. A p orbital is in an energetically stable spot when it is either half filled or fully filled. The same thing applies to the d orbitals. They like to be half filled or fully filled. So five electrons or 10. If that means one electron needs to be taken from the S orbital to fill up that remaining D orbital, that is a more energetically stable position. <clears throat> so we could also say that based on the electron configuration, we can determine the number of valence electrons, which are simply the energy level that is the highest. So for silicon, for example, the electrons are located in the 3s and 3p for the highest energy level. So this is simply the highest n energy level. Even if you have, for example, if we go back up, we have um, scandium, which is 4s2, 3d1. That will only have two valence electrons since 4s is the highest energy level and it has two electrons in the 4s. So the number of valence would simply be two. For titanium, same thing. For vanadium, same thing. Their valence electrons will be two in the ground state. The other electrons are called the core electrons, which are the electrons that are in the other energy levels that are not the highest. So here's the exception that I was talking about. We have noble gas configuration. So this is a way to abbreviate your electron configurations because a good thought would be, right, if I need to write the configuration for tungsten, that's all the way down here. I don't want to write every single orbital that I go through, right? Well, there's a way to get around that, which is you go through, you take the element that you want to find the configuration for, so let's say we did tungsten, and we went backwards until we found xenon, which is a noble gas. So we can write xenon in a bracket and then keep going. So it would be bracket xenon, 6s2, 5d1, 4f14, and then we would fill up that 5d to make it 5d3. And that would be tungsten. Or sorry, 5d4, and that would be tungsten. So that's one way to do electron configuration, which is valid for every single configuration. So that's what we see here. These bracket argon, bracket krypton. That is simply the abbreviated configuration. So electrons can be excited with energy if we move them into a different, and when they're excited by energy, they will move into a different um, orbital. And this gives us the properties of paramagnetism and diamagnetism, which we cover a lot more in chapter 11. So paramagnetism means you have at least one unpaired electron. Diamagnetism means you have all paired electrons. Next thing are the three periodic trends, atomic size, ionization energy, and electron affinity. So atomic radius, simply how big the atom is, or how big the element is. The ionization energy, which is the energy required to knock off an electron. The electron affinity, which is the energy released by gaining that electron back. And for all of these concepts, we need to keep in mind 
the effect of nuclear charge, our orbitals, and our number of protons. So the first trend is atomic radius. The atomic radius decreases going to the right on the periodic table and increases going down. So here's a good chart that shows it. If we go to the right, what is happening? The number of protons is increasing. Therefore, our effective nuclear charge is increasing. And even though our electrons are increasing as well, the protons that we add are now pulling the electrons in closer to make a tighter shell. That is why the size decrease is going to the right. Going down, we are simply adding more energy levels, so the atom gets a lot bigger. Ionization energy. That is the energy required to pull off an electron. And it's always positive. And it always increases when you have more ionization energies. So for example, aluminum, the first ionization energy is 580, then it goes 1800, then 2700. So it increases for every successive electron you take. Another thing that's important is if you have an anion, or sorry, a cation, cations are always smaller than their parent neutral atom. So if you lose that electron, what you're doing is you are losing that energy, or you're losing that energy level in a lot of the cases. This will greatly decrease the size of the atom. So when we see that for when ions like to take their normal ionic charge that we know from the periodic charges, such as calcium going from ground state, which has two valence, to plus two, which loses those two valence. Once it loses the two valence, the atom gets a lot smaller because that energy level is no longer present. It's like taking one of the rings away. Obviously, the atom will get smaller. And if you consider that making a cation gets the atom to be smaller, making an anion gets the atom to be bigger. And that's because we are adding electrons, which distributes the effective nuclear charge from the nucleus throughout the electrons and doesn't pull all of them as hard. It's easier to pull one electron than two, for example. So we can figure out from the ionization energy more about where the atom is positioned on the periodic table. So for sodium, the first ionization is pretty easy, but between the first and the second, there's a huge jump, a tenfold jump. The reason is because if you're taking away one electron from sodium, it gets to a noble gas configuration. If you're taking away another electron, you are taking away an electron from a noble gas, which has a full octet and a full, and a full eight valence electrons. It does not like that. Therefore, it will take a lot of energy. For magnesium, the same thing. First electron, not a big deal. Second electron, also not a big deal. Third electron, big deal. Because at this point, after it loses the second electron, the third would be taking it from a noble gas configuration. So generally speaking, the ionization energy increases going across the period due to the increase in effective nuclear charge, because if you have more protons that are pulling the electrons in, it will require more energy to knock off those electrons since they're being pulled in with more energy and you have to oppose that energy. Also, it decreases going down a group because the electrons that you're trying to kick off will be further away from the nucleus and easier to kick off and require less energy to do so. There are some discrepancies, however, because if we have a fully filled shell or a half filled shell, removing an electron might be harder to do. So for oxygen, which has three P, sorry, two P four, it's easier than removing one from nitrogen. So nitrogen has a completely half filled shell. Because we have the p orbital, it would be, you know, you have three p orbitals, it's p3. So it would be one electron per orbital. If you remove an electron from that, you're taking it from a half-filled shell, which I said before, is stable. Or is energetically favorable. If you do that, it's harder to do. Meanwhile, oxygen, you are adding an electron to nitrogen. And, of course, adding a proton. But once you add that electron, we're now in the P4 configuration. This means we have the half-filled shell plus another one. one. This other one could be removed pretty easily. So it's easier than removing one from nitrogen because removing that electron from the half-filled shell plus one gets it to its half-filled configuration, which it likes to be in. So there are some exceptions like that. And the last one is electron affinity. So electron affinity is the energy associated with the gain of an electron, and it's always a negative number. So it's a release of energy. 
And when we say the electron affinity is greater, that means the release is greater. So the absolute value is greater. So the electron affinity increases across a period because the more effective nuclear charge you have, that means the more the atom is going to like electrons. It will accept electrons better like fluorine. And in a, in a electron affinity will also decrease down a group because we are adding electrons to the next principal energy level. So they are adding, they're being added further away from the nucleus, which doesn't create that much of a disturbance and, and not much energy is released from that addition. So like I said before, if you have an anion, it increases the size of the atom. So the ground state atom to make it a cation decreases the size, the anion increases the size. Some other things, so halogens is just some other information that's in chapter nine. So halogens have are highly electronegative um, and they have high electron affinities and they're pretty reactive. Uh, noble gases we know are unreactive. They have extremely high electron um, ionization energies because they do not want to lose an electron. They're fully happy. And that's about it. If you have any questions, feel free to comment like the video and subscribe to the channel for more and happy studies.